my name is Mitchell Hashimoto. Um, I'm the founder and, uh, of HashiCorp, and we're the, I'm the primary creator of these six tools so far, um, including Atlas, which I'm going to show you today. So the six, uh, the six things around the logo are all open source projects. Uh, you heard at least one in the last talk, console. Um, so whatever. The C on the right side at 3 o'clock is console. Um, that's our project. Uh, we're also the creators of Vagrant, Packer, Surf, uh, Terraform, and Vault. They all do various different things in the data center, ranging from development environments to um, service discovery, networking, and all the way to security, cloud security. Um, so there's a, a lot of variety um, that we do. And I think a key differentiator for our projects is uh, they're very cloud friendly as well as legacy friendly. So we don't, we don't show you something shiny and then tell you too bad you can't have it if, you're, if you have some legacy stuff in your data center. And um, we try to make sure it works with both things. So. Um, I'm going to actually start by going over just uh, in a one slide bullet point of what each one of these th things do um, because it's important to understand how they relate to Atlas. So I'm going to start by going over that. Um, like I said, HashiCorp has those six projects. Uh, I don't expect you to really read this text. Um, they're just descriptions and, and they're all open source. So they're open source in the fact that you could view the source. They're also uh, open source licensed. So uh, liberally licensed, they're almost all um, Mozilla licensed, um, and they're all very. They all have a very active community, so um, you can kind of see how many contributors each one has, how many GitHub stars as a vanity metric, um, how many forks, and so on. Um, they all have their own, sometimes overlapping, overlapping, but often sort of disjunct communities. Like the, the cloud security people don't really get involved with, uh, you know, gossip protocols and things like that. So. Um, very diverse set of things, very active tools. Um, so going over each one, uh, starting with Vagrant. So Vagrant is our oldest tool. It's probably the most well-known. Um, it's been around since 2009. And it is a development environment tool. So the goal of Vagrant is to, for any developer, whether it's Java or PHP or Ruby or whatever you're using, to be able to check out a project from source control, run one command, and get a complete development environment on any operating system. So um, that's what Vagrant does. Uh, a, win a person using a Windows computer could check out a project that runs on Linux, run Vagrant up, and they get a full development environment. Or they could be running Linux, and it could be a Windows project, and the same thing. Um, it's meant to be this one command that just gives you your development environment no matter what is going on on your machine. Um, it's perhaps the most popular project, um, definitely the most well-known, but it gets millions of downloads per month, and it's, it's pretty old now. Um, I'm just going to be going, I think, in chronological order, the order we made these things. Um, but the next one is Packer. Uh, Packer is a tool that is, uh, helps development environments, but is start, start, starting to move into the data center here. So Packer is a tool that builds what I like to say deployable artifacts. Um, it used to just be machine images. Now it builds a lot more things. So it's just one command to build an AMI, a VMware image. Um, an OpenStack image, a Docker container, um, those sorts of things. So the problem we were trying to solve with Packer was that you need these sort of images and you usually need more than one. Um, even if you're using Docker, for example, you usually need a VMware image at some point or an Amazon image. And it, there's a lot of weird steps involved in each platform that are platform specific to create these images when really what you want to say is like, here's the foundation, here's the base, what we're starting from. Here's the layers I want you to put on top with shell scripts or PowerShell or um, Chef Puppet, you know, something like that. And here are the properties I want in the final image in terms of networking and storage and just make it happen. Like I don't want to know the, the minutia of step one through 50 in order to make this a reality. Um, so Packer lets you do that. You describe the image you want in JSON, you run one command. Um, and it creates it for the target platform you want. Um, it still requires you to know a little bit about the system you're targeting. Like, you can't just make one config and say, I want this same thing on both Amazon and Docker. You still need to know about each, but it lets you not have to worry about the steps involved to actually make that image. Um, and the way it sort of relates to Vagrant, it can also create Vagrant boxes. So um, a, a big use case is to use Packer to create both the production image that you're using as well as the development image um, at the same time. Uh, Packer is uh, pretty similar in terms of scale of Vagrant at this point. Uh, the next one's console. You heard about it in the last talk. 
Um, Console is a tool for service discovery, configuration, and orchestration. I talked about it a lot during my talk yesterday. Um, talked about all the features yesterday, so uh, I don't know if these are available anywhere else, but if you could watch that, that'd be useful. Um, Console was our first product project that went directly to the data center. It's not a development tool, it's a production runtime tool. Um, and as such, it has different properties. It's a distributed system, it's highly available, um, it stores data, so we have to be really careful about not losing data and things like that. And I mentioned in my talk yesterday that 10% uh, of the top 50 websites in the world run console, and we've never, ever, ever had a data loss incident. So, so far our track record's good. Um, it handles multiple data centers, and, and it's solving, the, the problem the console is solving is really in a new, highly service-oriented, or service-oriented earlier, containerized, you know, this distributed microservices in a data center, how do you do service discovery scalably? How does the web server find the database? How does the load balancer find the web servers, um, et cetera? And so console solving that problem. Uh, next, there's Terraform. Um, so Terraform is a tool for launching infrastructure, um, and it can launch infrastructure on a variety of platforms. So Amazon um, as a public cloud, you know, private clouds like OpenStack, even VMware, Azure, um, and it's even getting support shortly for physical data centers by pulling from uh, a lot of popular inventory management systems. So um, the, the goal of Terraform is to be able to codify the, the layout, the topology, the relationships of various machines in your data center, put it in text, run one command, and just step back and wait you know, 10, 20, 30 minutes, uh, and then come back to a fully realized, runnable data center, assuming the machines were already plugged in. Um, and that's what it does. So um, it could do all those different platforms. It could also combine them together. So this is, this is a pretty key piece also in the hybrid cloud sort of scenario. Um, because we get a lot of users that are perhaps currently on VMware and they're moving to something like Amazon instead, uh, but they're still able to describe both their older infrastructure, which sometimes they don't change because if, if you already have a PC compl PCI compliant VMware infrastructure, like that's probably the last thing to go. So you could keep that sort of going, you could keep your tools modern, and then you could move towards something like AWS at the same time with the same tools. And then finally, there's Vault. Um, this is our most recent project. It only was released about two months ago, or maybe six weeks ago. Um, Vault is secret management and certificate management. So um, Vault's very similar to console in that we just wanted a modern tool for managing secrets. Um, and uh, so it's, it's distributed. Um, it's meant for clouds, uh, but it's also built and, and works with physical data centers. Um, it is also a fully featured CA, so it, I mean, it, it could generate certs for you, it supports krills, it supports almost everything that you'd want in a CA, um, and, and it's pretty enterprise friendly for CA rise. Um, the, the first adopter we had for the CA was as Akamai, so um, Akamai is now using Vault uh, on their global CDN uh, across everything in order to generate certs um, for everything, basically, and they're going to be blogging about that, I think, next week. Um, so Vault is getting some pretty heavy usage, it's doing pretty well. Um, a key difference, the key modern take on Vault that's, that no commercial or free secret management solution has out there, um, and bear in mind that Vault is free and open source, is something we call dynamic secrets. I think it's a very modern take on secrets. A lot of, a lot of things that have secrets, like databases or um, API, uh, software as a service or something like that, support uh, identity management nowadays, uh, almost all of them, and almost all of them through an API. So dynamic secrets with Vault is basically the ability for a client to ask for a database credential, and instead of pulling something out of an HSM anywhere, it actually pulls the root keys out of an HSM, then talks to the database thing, generates you a database user with the right grouping on the fly with a lease associated with it, sends it back to you, um, and then you never get to see the root credentials. The root credentials never leave the secure, uh, barriers, secure barrier, um, and there's a lease, so if you don't renew that lease in a certain period of time, Vault Core uh, will revoke, delete that user, and you'll be out. Um, so that's a very, and we support that for AWS as well. And it's a very interesting concept. Um, it, it enables some interesting auditing capabilities. Now when there's a database breach, uh, every single web machine, every single thing accessing the database has a different, completely unique user bounded by a specific time. Uh, it makes auditing a lot nicer because you see oh, this user was the one making requests that weren't authorized. It had to have come from this process because the secrets never leave memory, basically. 
Uh, and then there's uh, Oh, there's audit logs, but we're also getting a full ISEC audit um, on Vault starting next month. So um, we'll have audit results if you want those. So that was a lot of projects. Those are that's sort of the work we've had over the past six years is to build all these projects out. Um, they're all seeing heavy um, use both in startups and enterprises, um, and we like to keep that balance that way. And so. That brings us to Atlas, which is what's the point? We have, we have all these separate things. They all do very different things. And what Atlas is, is uh, a tool to bring it all together. So in a diagram, this is sort of how we view Atlas. And then I do want to note on a precursor that Atlas is the commercial aspect of what we do. So all the projects I listed before this are all, like I said, open source in every way you could try to define that term. Um, and uh, Atlas is the commercial side of things. Um, so the goal of Atlas is basically to just get you from development to production. And that's actually why we've been building these tools. People, for a long time, I think, as we were building the tools, uh, people that have followed us said, like, oh, you came out with something like console that's super different from, from Vagrant. Like, what are you doing? Are you just, are you throwing darts at a wall and hoping you hit something? Like, are you hoping something happens? And, and actually, the whole time, we're trying to solve the same, this one problem. And the, the problem we're trying to solve is really you start in development and getting to production in a non-gimmicky way, in a real, like, maintainable way is very difficult to do uh, effectively. You know, there's things like Heroku, they'll get you up and running until they bleed your wallet, and then there's, there's sort of passes, but they put you in a very tight box, and the moment you're a millimeter outside of that box, they can do nothing for you. They go from doing everything for you to doing nothing. Um, so we were trying to solve this in a way where, how can we give you generic tools in order to solve your special problem, um, but still give you a pass-like feeling, and, and that's the direction we're heading with with Atlas. So, um, with Atlas, the idea is you have application code come in on the left. You know, this could come in through any means you feel comfortable with. It could be a Git push, it could be a direct upload, um, it could be API driven. It then enters Atlas, which is this whole box, which is what we run. Um, Atlas handles uh, the orchestration of the build process. So, um, talking to your CI, talking to um, Packer in order to get the AMI or the Docker container or whatever you need to build it. Um, it enters our own artifact registry, so we do artifact inventorying across anything, uh, Amazon images, containers, etc. Um, we do versioning, we do targeting environments, dev staging, um, targeting platforms, so you're able to tag images as this is the 32-bit image, the 64-bit image, that sort of stuff. Um, it could get, the artifact registry could get the most complicated, but we store that. Um, we then do deployment for you, so this is powered by Terraform. Um, Terraform pulls the artifact out of the artifact registry and orchestrates a deploy. And Terraform is a tool that supports things such as rolling deploys, um, uh, just deploy lifecycle stuff, you know, cr deploy the new thing before you destroy the old thing, uh, deploy 30% of the new thing while keeping 70% of the old thing. Uh, Terraform is the one that does that, so um, we kick that off. And then ultimately, out of the end, you just have your application deployed and running. Um, and throughout this process, you get logs, governance, um, ACLs, like all sorts of stuff that you would want um, at, at kind of the highest level of using a tool like this. And so um, the important thing to, to see here, and it's sort of faded away, um, but each one of these boxes is powered by one of our open source projects. So you could see how Atlas is just the unifier of all the things. And, and you, you could get all the open source projects off the shelf and try to build something like this yourself, and you would succeed after some amount of investment into engineering effort. Um, but the reason we build Atlas is because we found a lot of companies don't want to do that. Like if, if your core competency is building cars, you don't want to build a complete CI uh, pipeline with auditing and all this stuff and gluing projects together that you'd necessarily need support contracts for and things like that. So instead we simplify it and give that to you if that's what you want. Um, so some bullet points uh, on Atlas. So like I said, it's built on top of the open source. It does add some additional features for o each open source project, um, which if you want to construe as being open core in some way, you could. Um, but we don't. We run binary equivalent um, binaries of all our open source projects that you could download from the internet. So we don't modify the source of any of those projects, uh, but we do add features to them. So um, I don't think I give any examples. But uh, for example, Vagrant uh, Vagrant does um, box discovery, 
uh, box permissions, box sharing, that boxes are the development environments. Um, if you're running console, you get a UI, you get uh, alerting from the monitoring, so we'll send it to PagerDuty, Slack, text message, so on when things go unhealthy. So those are just examples of just individual features that we have. Um, but really, the, the real value out of Atlas is then combining things. So uh, one thing Atlas could do is, is console, Terraform deploys something, console's running on that thing, and console knows whether something is healthy or unhealthy. Um, but it knows this yes, no state, but it doesn't know how to fix that. It doesn't know how to resolve that issue. Um, Terraform knows how to fix problems. Um, so you could configure web servers, they're stateless, just try to fix the problem automatically. If you see a web server unhealthy, then spin, just replace it, um, and you can do that with Atlas. So console will see that something's unhealthy, it'll communicate it to Atlas, Atlas will check its rules, see that it can replace it, it'll communicate it back to Terraform and do an automatic deploy, um, basically. So that's an example of one combination of features, but there's sort of a line through everything. Um, and the bottom pool point's really interesting. So Atlas just works on all the platforms that our open source supports. Um, so it's very hybrid cloud friendly. You could, you could manage both an Amazon, a completely dedicated Amazon cluster with this as well as something like VMware. Um, and as an additional thing, as more platforms come into the open source, they immediately become available in Atlas. So um, as an example, Terraform got Azure support a week ago um, and that week now Atlas supports Azure, like it just happens because we're just running the binary equivalent open source. So um, you just sort of get that out of the box. Oh, I did, I did show examples, but it's not important. Um, and so then other things Atlas adds on top is things like governance. Um, so you're able to say who could do what when. Um, provenance is a big one. Um, in this more and more service oriented sort of environment, it's hard to know how the code that was on someone's laptop got into production and who, who touched a release and things like that. So Atlas actually gives you this, this barrier where it records all that for you. So you could, you could start at a service that's running, you know, that Hadoop job that's running right there and you could click on that and Atlas will give you the full path backwards of here's when it was deployed, who initiated the deploy, here's how the artifact was built, who initiated the build, here's the configuration for the build, here are the commits that came in from GitHub for this thing, here are all the different actors, here's who trigger the thing. It, it goes all the way back and across different systems, so we just traversed you know, AWS to a CI potentially, um, back to GitHub, uh, to the sort of the user's laptop. So you, you get this full path through uh, if you want to see what happened. Um, it's very DevOps friendly, so you're, if you want to go in and govern that there are silos and put people in groups that only operators could deploy and only developers could do this and, and no one could trigger the deploy other than these people, like you could do that. Um, but also, it gives you the opportunity to just, you know, say this team could just go all the way through and things like that. So it lets you more easily, we talked about DevOps at the panel yesterday, it lets you sort of more easily transition to that sort uh, of uh, environment. So there's, there's minimal lock-in. I mean, there's, Atlas itself is commercial and closed source. Obviously, the open source isn't. Um, Atlas lets you export any of the configs we're using for the open source at any time. Um, and also, it lets you use any cloud. So it's less lock-in than anything, than something like a VMware thing um, and multi-cloud. So I just want to show you a demo now. Um, the demo is going to be very simple. I'm just going to use AWS. Um, but it's very easy to extrapolate how this would work with another or multiple clouds. So um, let's start by building an AMI. I'm going to ignore this for now because I don't want to run out of time. Um, oh. Okay. I'm just going to run this. Start this. Okay, I'm just going to start that because it has to build an actual AMI. Um, and then I'm going to try to drag this off screen. So this is the Atlas UI. Um, so this is the build I just pushed. This is going to run Packer. This is going to build us an AMI that just has an Apache web server um, running on it. Um, let me just open this. 
So if you were to run Packer manually from your laptop, you'd see this too. Um, so we're just running it for you in a VM. Uh, but the thing is, it's automated. This could have been triggered from a Git push or something like that. And I wanted to show that, but there's just not that much time. Um, so we're going to wait for that to go. And while it's going, I'm going to show you the config. So this is the config that we just pushed up there. It's JSON. It's just basically saying build an Amazon thing. There's some additional stuff in the real one of what the source AMI is. Um, and then there's a shell provisioner that just installs Apache. Um, and then this post processor here um, is what says then take the artifact you build, put it into the Atlas artifact registry, name it Cisco Live, and it's an AMI. Um, so that'll happen. Then we ran this. Um, Packer push is the way to get your local templates into Atlas and running. So it's doing that right now. You saw me do that. And then let's see if it's just going. Yeah, that's just going to run. Um, I'll go over the next part just so we're ready. So after that image is built, we're going to use Terraform to deploy it. Um, the way that works is you configure Terraform. The red parts are what's important. The top, the big one, the top one, is pulling the artifact information from Atlas. So the Cisco Live image I made with that AMI, pulling it, and then the bottom red part is taking the actual AMI for the East region um, and using it to start an AWS instance. Um, so that just connects things together, and then we're going to start two of them. So we'll visit it and should see the default uh, Apache page when it's done. And to get that going, it's the same process. You Terraform push to get your config all up there. Um, but again, the same thing. The Packer build could trigger the Terraform run once it's up there. This is just it is sort of to show that your operators still get to work in a way they're comfortable. They check things out. They work locally. They test things locally. And when they're ready, they push it up there. Um, and we have GitHub integration through all this, too. So instead of doing this, you could actually push it to your GitHub repo and then have Atlas pull from there to get the latest. So let's see if. Cool. So yeah, that thing's running. Um, let me actually get out of this. Um, the AMI is done. It's just not ready yet. So, um, yep. Then we'll go to environments and see the deploy happen. Let me just get that ready. I can't push that till the AMI exists, otherwise it'll, it'll try to deploy it and it'll fail. Um, so I'm just waiting for that. OK. Should be good in like five seconds. Yeah. OK, so it's there. Um, we can now run this. Um, so now if we're back here, this, this build succeeded. It finished. Um, you can go to your environments. You can see environments are all the different applications or infrastructures, however you want to categorize it. Um, if I had console connected, this page would show me the actual real-time status of my infrastructure, but I don't. Um, so I'll go to changes. Changes is sort of like a commit view for your infrastructure. You can actually see the history of what's changed. You can see I just triggered the first run, so it's new. Uh, it gave me the plan of what's going to happen. I'm just going to confirm it. So there's approval stuff there. You can see what's going to happen, approve it. And then uh, it'll actually make stuff happen. Um, I don't think we'll have time to wait for the instances to come up, but we'll have time to see it start, at least. Yep, so that's Terraform actually running in a VM, spinning up infrastructure. Um, and to show you something more interesting, we manage Atlas through Atlas. Um, so this is the actual, like, Here's Atlas's actual infrastructure, so you can see the state of things. Um, and then you can see all the changes that have been happening. Um, a lot of stuff today, 25 minutes ago, so I'm glad it's still running. <laughs> no, we, we have an SLA across all this, so if you sign up, there is an SLA. Um, and that's, that's sort of it, so let me switch back to here. And yeah, so that's, that's that. And then next steps you can do is sort of GitHub integration, multi-cloud, hook up console to see that monitoring view, stuff like that. 
Um, that's it. Thank you. Mitchell Hashimoto.